pumped it in the news and announcements. Um, uh, uh, tonight's speaker, Dr. An Andrew Leslie, uh, Assistant Professor at Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology uh, at Brown University. Uh, is fundamentally interested in uh, morphological diversification of organisms. Um, he received his bachelor's from University of uh, Pennsylvania, geology and biochemistry. Uh, his PhD was done at University of Chicago, um, Department of Geophysical Sciences. And uh, tonight, Dr. Leslie will be speaking on the evolution of conifer cones across time and space. Thanks for having me, and thanks for coming out on this particular evening. Um, so when I suggested this talk title, it was Across Time and Space, and as I put the talk together, I realized it was pretty much only about time, so I put space here in parentheses. But I want to talk about the evolution of conifer cones in time, in the sense of geological time, so over their entire evolutionary history, and as we'll see, sort of about their developmental time. So I want to talk about how cones change in their functionality and their morphology as they develop, um, and how that can influence patterns in the revolution. So I'm fundamentally interested in the evolution of morphology. I kind of like to know why things look the way they do. And of course, that's a question that kind of touches on every aspect of biology. So as we do, I sort of focus on a particular group, and I focus on plants in a broad sense, and conifers in particular, to try and understand the factors that sure of shape the evolution of morphological diversity. And I study plants just beyond liking them, thinking they're interesting, because in some sense they're a more tractable system to try and understand why things look the way they do. Plant form kind of closely adheres to function, and these functions haven't really changed all that much throughout their history. A leaf in the Paleozoic is doing a lot of the same things that a leaf is doing now, and its form can reflect the kind of the same set of sort of functional constraints and hydraulic constraints and things like that. So that's why I study plants, and also because plants have a long fossil record that we can draw from. And so we can look at the changes in forms throughout time, and because plants are relatively simple, we can assume that a, that a conifer in the Jurassic, like this conifer here, is doing a lot of the same things that a conifer cone is doing now. There's not some sort of crazy behavior like we get in animal fossils where we really don't know what that thing on the shark's head is doing. We sort of know what these cones are doing. We can understand um, how the functions have changed through time and how that might influence their morphology. So in my research in general, I try to combine the fossil record with studies of functional morphology, so asking how things actually work. And I combine that with a large-scale phylogenetic analysis of trying to understand how things are related to each other. And in order to understand this broader question about what drives morphological evolution and generates diversity over long time scales, and by long time scales I mean up to hundreds of millions of years. So of course I'll be talking about conifers uh, tonight, so I just wanted to a little background on conifer biology and why I think they're a useful group to study. So we often think of conifers as uh, the sort of characteristic trees of the sort of boreal forests and in mountain environments. I'll tell you that conifers are actually more diverse in terms of species richness in the tropics and in the subtropics. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But conifers are one of five major seed plant lineages that are still extant. The relationships, this isn't an accident, the relationships amongst these groups are basically not known. Um, and so this, we have conifers, we have Neetales, things like ephedra and needum. We have the one species of ginkgo, uh, 300 cycads, and then all the angiosperms that we have out here. But these are the remains, these five lineages are the remains of, of more than 20 major lineages that used to exist in seed plant evolutionary history. And there's just a few that are left. And conifers are the most diverse of these non-flowering plant seed plant lineages. Now, although their relationships amongst all these groups are poorly known, the phylogenetic relationships amongst conifers are pretty well known. So this is a, a tree showing the relationships amongst these groups and their approximate divergence dates as based on uh, molecular data and um, fossils. So we have pines, we have the podocarps, and the monkey puzzles, which people may be a little less familiar with. These are southern hemisphere and tropical conifers primarily. We have Cyatopodus, the monotypic Japanese umbrella pine. It's a very interesting plant. And then we have a sister taxa here, the yews, which sort of surprisingly are closely related to the cedars and the cypresses of 
these relationships were not really able to be resolved until the advent of molecular systematics because a lot of the cones, as we'll see of these things, which is what people primarily use to figure out these relationships, have become kind of weird over time and they're difficult to make sense of who's related to whom. So one thing that's nice about conifers, they're ancient, they come from this sort of uh, old lineage and they have a global distribution. So this is sort of a species heat map of conifers across the world and we know we often think of them, as I said, in the boreal forests where they're very ecologically important and dominant. But most species richness is actually in mountain areas, often in the subtropics and tropics. So the two places in the world that have the most conifer diversity is New Caledonia, so this tropical island in the South Pacific, and the mountains in western China, the Hingguang Mountains, the highest species richness of conifers. But as you can see, conifers are concentrated here in mountain belts. We all sort of know that. Um, and in these broad areas where they're ecologically dominant, there's actually not that many species. So in addition to having this sort of global distribution, and we can sort of try and understand how climate and environment might shape the morphology of conifer cones, we also have kind of a rich ecology. So as you're probably familiar with, conifers have strong interactions with animals, with insects, with fire, with climate. So we all know sort of squirrels munch on conifer cones from time to time. Fires play an important role in the distribution and reproductive biology of many conifers. Uh, many conifers are biotically dispersed, so this is a Clark's nutcracker uh, taking out the seeds of a white bark pine, just gonna cache them and disperse them later. So they have their cones, these structures that I wanna understand why they look the way they do, are sort of at the intersection of all these interesting ecological interactions. And from my perspective as a paleobotanist, probably the most interesting thing about conifers is the history, the length of time in which we can look at them, evolution. So here's just an old compilation of the number of fossil species in the record. You can see that conifers go back to the late Carboniferous. Uh, this is a bit out of date, as you can see here. The, the current sort of record is 310 million years. So there have been conifers for 310 million years, and ever since about 200 million years ago, throughout the entire period of dinosaurs here, conifers are really the most dominant uh, in terms of uh, abundance that we find in fossil assemblages. So there's a big chunk of Earth's history where conifers were the main uh, kind of component of forests. And we have a good fossil record uh, from that. We have cones that are preserved here in charcoal from the, the late Cretaceous. We have permineralized cones that preserve all sorts of aspects of their cellular um, anatomy. Actually, in many cases, these look pretty much like you'd find uh, if you went out into the forest and collected them now. So we know a lot, potentially, about the morphology. So, what I want to talk today about today is the evolution of all this stuff. So here's sort of a tile picture I put together showing this kind of spectrum of typical conifer cones that we might think of, all the way to these things that look like raspberries and fruits. So there's a tremendous diversity of forms here. All of these are cones of a variety. And as you can probably imagine, these represent different sort of ways of protecting and dispersing seeds. And I'll talk about that when these sort of morphologies arose and why I think that they did. So, in order to get everyone to run the same page, I want to make sure we know what conifer cones actually do. And they're not just this simple kind of seed and closing device. That's one thing that they do. But they have a complicated history. So, you know, a conifer cone is going to be initiated in bud as this little thing here. It has one functional stage where it captures pollen. So all, all conifers are wind pollinated. They all have these structures that in some capacity funnel wind into this cone. Uh, where the seeds are on the inside. But then, of course, this open structure has to close. And so, as conifers grow and mature, the cones close and protect the developing seeds. And then, at some point, however, they have to open up and disperse those seeds. So they have these different uh, functional roles that they perform over their lifetime, sometimes dramatically different functional roles that can be sort of diametrically opposed to each other. So any conifer cone morphology that you see, you could think of it as a set of, of solutions generated by developmental sequence to solve a series of functional problems, capturing pollen, protecting seeds, and dispersing seeds. And at any point along this kind of trajectory, you can have different development that's going to give you different types of cones, different shapes. So I want you to understand that kind of for cone morphology is not a static thing, but rather sort of time series. And this is true really of any seed plant reproductive structure. If you have a flower going to a fruit, if you have a flower going to a watermelon, you're, you're seeing a lot of different changes in shape as the functions of that reproductive structure change. So what I want to do today is just 
tell you a couple of stories about how differences in development or function might be able to generate the morphological diversity that we see in conifer cones. So the first talk, the first part I want to talk about the sort of generation of morphology at pollination. And I want to show you how just simple differences in development that probably aren't related to any sort of functional or selective advantage uh, can generate morphological diversity. The second part I want to focus on these sort of seed protection and seed dispersal aspects. And I want to argue that changes in seed protection and dispersal over the Mesozoic, particularly in the Jurassic and Cretaceous, generate the range of cone morphologies we see today. So all those little red berries and all those big, thick, woody cones, that basically originates in the Jurassic and Cretaceous and accelerates over the past 65 million years. And as you can imagine, I think that relates to squirrels and birds and things like that. So let's talk about this sort of morphological diversification at pollination. And this particular set of projects is going to take place entirely in the Pinaceae. So I'm going to be talking about uh, spruces and fir cones here. So all conifer cones, as best we can tell, with the exception of the Taxaceae, which I can talk about more if you're interested, but basically all of them are compound shoot systems. So any cone you see, and there's some I have on the table here, has an axis and it has a system of branches. So we call this branch an ovuliferous scale, and that's the thing that bears a seed, and that's the kind of typical scale that you see in a conifer cone. That shoot system is subtended by a little leaf, which we call bract. And so here, on a pollination stage spruce cone, these red things here, the bigger red things, are the ovuliferous scale, that's that modified shoot system. And then this little whitish structure below it is the bract, that's that leaf that's subtending that. So all conifer cones have this basic structure, sort of basic developmental pattern, but not all of them look, of course, exactly the same. So a long time ago, I noticed, and other people certainly noticed, that a spruce cone here and a fir cone at the time of pollination, they have a general, vaguely similar look to them. They have these scales that have openings so that pollen can get inside them. But the actual units of this cone are quite different. So in a, in a spruce in Picea, it's this ovuliferous scale that is the bigger structure and that kind of dominates and forms the sort of aerodynamic scaffolding of the structure here. In Abies, it's the bract that's the bigger one. And this little red thing here is the ovuliferous scale. So they seem to be doing kind of a similar thing but with different structures. And what we wanted to know, it seems sort of obvious, is can you explain this difference with just a sort of simple developmental shift? So what's going on to generate these two cones? at the time of pollination. And are they functionally different? Are these just basically the same solution, the different solutions to the same problem? Or do they actually have different functionality? Is one of them actually better at capturing pollen uh, from the wind? So this is a, one project that my postdoc Juan Lasada worked at. And this is all from conifers collected here at the Arnold Arboretum. Uh, on this hill in particular, uh, we collected uh, cones as they develop. This is a pretty intensive thing. You have to sort of come back every couple of days, sometimes more than that, and collect these as they develop and, and uh, sort of determine the anatomy of these structures. So Juan is an excellent microscopist and anatomist, and he embedded these developing cones, sometimes for months, to impregnate them with resin, and then section them in these large sections that I want to show you here. So let's look at the development of these two taxa. We have a fur over here and a spruce. So this is early in their development. Conifers basically make uh, future seed cone buds at the end of summer. And these are buds that are sectioned in October after they've developed a little bit, right before winter. So you cut it open, you can see this sort of a main axis here, a pith, and you have basically the outlines of the bracts. In Abies, that's all you see, just the bracts. In Picea, in spruces, you have bracts as well as these little nubbins here are what will be the ovuliferous scale, that, that <coughs> modified branch that bears the seeds. And those haven't yet formed in Abies. And this is going to be what we see always. Picea is faster, developed faster than Abies, develops its structures sooner. So let's go forward now, right before they break bud in early April. Now Abies actually has its ovuliferous scales. The bracts in Picea have actually stopped growing, and the ovuliferous scales have gotten somewhat bigger. So the bracts in Picea will stop growing from here on, they will never grow anymore whereas the bracts and abies will continue to grow. And you can already see that, once again, there's more development of the scales here in Picea versus AB. 
So let's go on to pollination. Now what happens at pollination, the cone axis elongates. These cells that were laid down earlier elongate and they pull the cone apart and they make spaces between these individual scale units where wind can blow pollen through the cone now. In Picea and spruces, the ovulifer scale has continued to grow. The bracts have continued to not grow. And that's why you get this structure here, which is dominated by these ovulifer scales. What's happened in abies, that the ovulifer scales haven't really grown all that much, but the bracts have continued to grow and develop and push out. And that's why you're seeing a primarily bract dominated thing. So again, it's just a simple, faster rate in Picea of the development of these scales that leads to these two different types of morphologies. And as we go further in developmental time, the cones, they've been open, they've collected pollen, the seeds are pollinated, and now they need to close these things up to prevent fungi and insects and everything else from eating the seeds or any other tissue inside there. And they close in slightly different ways. So here, the ovuliferous scales are continuing to grow larger. They actually have a lot of cell proliferation down here in the base that flips these things up and closes them and sort of seals off the cone. Whereas in aves, these ovulifer scales are finally growing now and they basically become kind of uh, thick and fat and they seal the cone that way. So we have two different ways of sealing the cone off. But at this point, the ovulifer scale in both of them now uh, takes on all the sort of functional roles. So here we see the remains of these bract tips sticking out and we see these larger ovulifer scales here. And in Picea, we have these flipped and imbricated ovulifer scales. So that's the general kind of developmental trajectory that's going on. And what I've told you is that Abies just develops more slowly and why it intersects pollination when it still is primarily bracted dominated. And we can see that in quantitative form if we look at the relative sizes of the cells as these structures develop. So here is the relative size. So it's that the cell size is scaled relative to its maximum size that it will have in each, in each taxon. And we're looking at the pith cells here and the cortex cells. Let's do those first. So what you see is in both Aves and Picea, you have the sudden expansion of the pith cells and sudden expansion of the cortex cells right around the time of pollination. This didn't really come through, but pollination occurs in early May, the first week of May. So right before pollination happens, you have the break bud, the cones elongate, and they create these gaps where you can have pollen filtering through the cone. Okay? Now at the same time, you have the bracts and the ovulifer scales developing slightly differently. So these things are similar in Aves and Picea. The mechanism of cone opening is similar in Aves and Picea, but actually what's making these structures is different. So here in Aves, we have the ovuliferous, the uh, bract rather, uh, it develops more slowly and it becomes much larger at the time of pollination. The bract of Aves, or Picea rather, develops really quickly and it stops growing as I showed you when it's still in a small stage. The ovuliferous scales develop more quickly in Picea uh, and more rapidly in Picea and they make the larger structure that you see at pollination. So again, we have this heterochronic shift where it just development happens faster in Picea. Now as you go forward in time and you have this sort of transition to this protective role, basically the ovuliferous scale assumes all function in all taxa. So yes, a simple developmental shift can explain these differences. What happens is simply that this thing develops more quickly and you end up getting, at the time of pollination, a structure that's dominated by these ovulifer scales. And so the question then becomes, do they actually function differently? Is this basically a meaningless variation in development? And they pretty much do function the same way. Let's see if I can get this movie to work. So this is a fir cone in a wind tunnel. You can see in slow-mo now, it's actually working here, which it doesn't appear to be. I saw something. 
you see, the pollen grains actually, well, it just stops real. The pollen grains actually hit these things and they just jostle around and go into the little slats in between these scales. So these openings here between the bracts, basically pollen just hits it and kind of jostles around through it. And you see a similar thing in Picea. I wonder if it stops working. Or if it it's just a preloading on the internet. They should be in the. They should be in the. Uh, in the. There you go. So there's a huge cloud of pollen hitting it. You can see these things sort of bounce around, and they jostle in between the scales, and they kind of find their way into these cracks. And the seeds, of course, are inside. It seems to not like it when I hit the. Laser pointer. So a similar thing happens in AVs. Now maybe this will work. So there's a huge cloud of pollen that we hit this thing with, and, and then you can see that the, the things basically work in the same way. And that's true when you pluck all these scales off and dissect them. The distribution of pollen grains here with the with red being the highest distribution of grains is always concentrated around the openings of the ovules themselves. There's no real difference amongst different wind speeds and in different taxa about exactly what this looks like. There's a slight statistical difference, but that's really just due to the relative position of the opening of the ovules. So we interpret this to mean that these things are basically functioning similarly. One is not really a lot better at capturing pollen grains than the other. I should also say that we're injecting roughly similar amounts of pollen grains into these uh, into the wind tunnel because the pollen grains are around the same size in both species. So we think that we see these different forms simply due to a difference in development and not through any major difference in functionality. And because in general the whole pine family shares this basic pattern of cone development, bract first and then the ovular for scale, we see similar types of variation across the tree. So things like pines have kind of similarly sized bracts and ovuliferous scales. Picea, this kind of Picea morphology is, is known in cedrus, in the cedars. And then Aves and a number of, and larches and Douglas firs have this sort of uh, bract first morphology. So the distribution appears random, and it's not related to any sort of obvious climatic patterns either. So we think it's just neutral variation in the rate of development which generates this morphology. And you can see this play out over the course of cone development. So here's a young Douglas fir. It's dominated by these bracts. And when you see a characteristic mature Douglas fir cone, these things that stick out, these sort of weird things that stick out, are just the remains of these bracts that were once important during pollination. In this taxon, for some reason, the base of the bract continues to grow as the cone grows, and that pushes that original bract surface out even further. I don't know if there's any functional significance to these things being or an outside of the cone. I don't particularly think so. I think they're just the remains of originally having uh, bracts as your uh, dominant structure. So what I want you to see is that even in something as relatively simple and straightforward as wind dispersed or so wind pollination, we can have a different set of morphological solutions generated by slight differences in development to this one problem. Now a variety of morphologies are evidently adequate to facilitate pollination, these all seem to work just fine. Uh, and the possible shapes are probably not that tightly constrained because wind pollination is kind of a general process. You don't have to have some really specific geometry to fit the thorax of a particular wasp or something like that. So in this particular case, it seems like having a broad functional constraint like wind pollination, coupled with slight differences in development, leads to morphological differentiation or diversity. So now what I want to do is talk more about this after pollination morphology, the kind of morphology that we're used to seeing. These structures here aren't all that, they don't last all that long, um, and they're not the kind of cones that we're used to seeing. It's these structures here, the dispersed cones, and maybe the maturing cones, that we kind of think of when we think of conifer cone diversity. So as I said, what I think has happened is that at some point in the Jurassic, you had an increase in seed predation intensity and seed dispersal potential. And you see the same kinds, you see the evolution of the morphologies that we uh, are so sort of characteristic today.
And as I'll show you, the earlier conifer cones from the Triassic, from the Permian, from the Paleozoic are very long and thin. They're basically the kind of cones that could never protect against a squirrel or anything else. Um, if you had a cone like that now, it would be stripped of seeds uh, very quickly. So here, these particular projects are going to be talking about uh, all the conifer clays. So we're going to be talking about uh, everything from the little berry-like structures of yews to the robust cones of Pinesia. And again, this is where I'm really going to try to explain where this diversity comes from. All these cones started out looking fairly different when they pollinated, and they diverged uh, even further from each other over the course of their development as they perform these different functional roles. So, but I do want you to understand that even these aberrant looking cones are still the same basic morphology. So this is a podocarbaceae cone, if you want to call it that. It looks like a little berry. There's a seed that's encased within some tissue here with some fleshy, uh, attractive tissue below it. This tissue is a bract, and it's equivalent to the bract that we saw in Aves that sticks out from the cone in Douglas fir, and that helps to pollinate uh, in Aves. The ovuliferous scale in a podocarbus is actually this sort of clasping tissue that's derived um, from the ovuliferous scale here, and it kind of surrounds the seed. So you can think of this structure as just one unit of what used to be a more complicated cone. And that does appear to be what happened in the evolution of this family. But overall, when we look at this sort of pattern of, of morphologies, we see a few kind of general patterns. We have these sort of big, woody, robust cones. They tend to have a lot of seeds. And they tend to have relatively small seeds, not always, but usually. So you could sort of think of these, obviously, as a defense specialist. And particularly, Pinus pungens here has these large pointy scales. On the other hand, there seem like they're morphologies that are sort of completely the opposite direction. They have few seeds in them. The seeds are generally large, and they're often fleshy. Obviously, these sort of look like they're dispersal specialist cones. They're not very well protected, but perhaps they're inviting animals uh, to take these seeds. Uh, they're sort of trading off protection versus dispersal. And you can imagine that most of these two kind of general solutions to the problems of being a conifer, dispersing your seeds, kind of make sense in a world dominated by, or at least a world filled with vertebrates and seed predators of all kinds. So let's imagine you were these sort of small fleshy cones with big seeds. Each one has a fairly high investment in individual offspring and potentially good dispersal potential because an animal may pluck this along and uh, distribute it some distance from the tree. But these large seeds are attractive to predators, so you're kind of making that trade-off, perhaps. Whereas in a pine cone, you have high investment in protection, a lot of this woody material that's around the cone. But the seeds aren't really dispersed in any particularly special way. Most of them are wind dispersed. The seeds are kind of, they're on their own. And each individual seed is smaller and less attractive to predators in a very broad kind of general sense. So again, you can imagine these dispersal specialists versus protection specials. And what exactly are they dispersing with and protecting from? Well, there's all sorts of things. So birds are some of the most common seed dispersers and predators in modern conifers, particularly corvids. Uh, so you have corvids here, the nutcrackers and crows and things like that are important seed dispersal agents for many pines in particular. You have crossbills, which are major seed predators for things like spruces and other things that have relatively small cones. Squirrels are generally thought to be uh, seed predators, but some also are known to disperse things by caching them in seed hordes. And you, of course, you have this background of predation from insects and from fungi and things like fire. So there's all these things that are poten potentially acting on them. But I would say that most of the literature that's looked at interactions between seed dispersers and predators and conifers has focused on squirrels and birds as these big sort of characteristic charismatic agents. So I said conifers have a long fossil record. Squirrels and corvids don't have a long fossil record. The conifers go back to 300 million years ago. And these things at the sort of latest are coming in at the beginning of the um, Cenozoic here. So with modern day rodents and passerine birds. Actually, conifers predate the occurrence of vertebrate herbivores, period. Vertebrate herbivores um, don't appear until the latest Carboniferous because it's hard to be an herbivore. 
And so conifers actually predate them by a while. And it wasn't until the latest Triassic that you had large vertebrate herbivores that were even capable of browsing more than a couple meters off the ground. So for a large, a large part of conifer history here in the beginning of their history, they shouldn't have been interacting with or seeing any of the kinds of things that shape the morphology of cones today. But somewhere in the middle, this must have changed with the evolution of early birds um, and the radiation of early mammals. We'll talk about that a little bit. So the first thing that I want to do is focus on the evolution of these robust kind of woody cones, which you can imagine are the things that are easier to see in the fossil record. Squishy little berries made out of sugar don't really preserve all that well in the fossil record. So another advantage of cones is that you can kind of look at their robustness, if you will, fairly easily. They're pretty compact and regular objects. You can simply measure their total length and width at a first pass to quantify the amount of tissue that's actually invested in them. And they come in, of course, in a wide range of sizes and morphologies. So let's look at length and width of cones through time. Just this very simple approach to trying to understand how these tissues are allocated in cones and whether they've changed in time as the conifer groups have experienced different types of animals, um, sea predators and species. So here I'm showing some data that I compiled a long time ago of all sort of measurable conifer cones um, from different geologic time periods. And these are all sort of the modern day ones. You see there's a big range of sizes in the modern. But in general, there's no major change in maximum cone length per time. You actually see the evolution of smaller cones here in the Jurassic and Cretaceous. But there is an important change in cone width through time. So the earliest conifer seed cones in the Carboniferous and the Permian and into the Triassic are fairly narrow structures. They don't have a lot of, of girth to them. This is the data again, and this is the average. Um, and so it wasn't until the Jurassic and the Cretaceous leading on to now where you get the evolution of these robust, proportionally wide cones, these sort of spherical globular structures. So things go from looking like these long spindly structures that essentially have no modern analog to these wider things that are the recognizable conifer cones. Um, and that occurs basically in the Jurassic. And the first thing to do it here, if anyone's interested, is one of the earliest is this cone, uh, Ericaria mirabilis, uh, from Argentina. This is a, a rock, this is a petrified cone from the Jurassic about 170 million years ago. And it's one of the earliest ones that has this robust kind of wide cone structure. And it looks almost indistinguishable from a modern day member of that genus. So this is, you can imagine that the width might be influenced by a lot of things. Maybe the seeds are just getting bigger. And so the cone has to get wider to accommodate these longer seeds. Maybe that's all there is to it. That doesn't appear to be what's going on. So if you look at seed size relative to the length of the scale that subtends them, so some measure of the amount of tissue that's surrounding them, at least in woody cones, the average volume or the average size of seeds has stayed roughly constant whereas the length of the scale has increased over time. And it got really larger in the Cretaceous and now. So my interpretation of this is that there's just simply more tissue surrounding that cone. So not only are they fatter, but they also have these larger scales subtending them with roughly similar size seeds. And so to me, that suggests that they're simply investing a lot more in this woody protective tissue. And this tissue is not trivial. This is woody, thick, dense tissue. It's a fair amount of carbon that they're investing in these structures. And if you're able to see these cones, visit and look at them like I've done, you really get a sense that the kinds of cones that you see in the Carboniferous and the Permian, the Triassic, or before the Jurassic, are just very different in overall shape and morphology from modern day ones. They're long and thin, they're flimsy, they're often bent, and you see them when they're fossilized. The, cone, the seeds in these things are often right at the surface. There's no protective tissue. Whereas from the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, we see in these different fossil cones here from the Jurassic, from the Cretaceous, you have uh, a much more typical globular robust looking structure. These have roughly the same size seeds on average, but they just have more tissue surrounding those seeds. So the cone goes from what's essentially an open, not particularly woody scaffold that has just a bunch of seeds on it, to being something that's much more of a vessel that seems to wall them off from the outside world. 
And this actually happens independently in all the major conifer lineages. So we know from the fossil record and from molecular dates that all these lineages diverged uh, well before the Jurassic. So these black triangles here refer to the estimated age of the earliest diverging modern day lineages of these groups. We call them crown lineages. So the most distantly related modern day pines diverge probably around the Jurassic. It's, it's a little bit questionable. But the point is that these major lineages all diverge from each other in the Triassic of the Permian, well before we see changes in cone morphology. So that means that all these broad, robust cones are independently derived. So there seems like there's a general pressure acting on all the things that have woody cones uh, across this time period. Now it just so happens that the types of shifts that we see in conifer cones towards more protective tissue, a proportionally more protective tissue relative to seas, mirror the same kinds of patterns that you see in modern day populations that are experiencing high squirrel and bird predation pressure. So there's a lot of literature about this, but when you look across populations of modern day conifers where part of their range experiences really heavy squirrel predation or bird predation, you typically see populations within that developing more cone tissue, fewer seeds, so that they're less attractive these animals. Because squirrels are very selective, as far as I understand. So literature suggests that they will really trade off between different populations, different species, if they can get just a few seconds less uh, sort of processing time. So if they have to sort of chew that thing for three seconds versus four, they'll really choose the one that they can chew on just for three seconds to, to get all the seeds out of it. And so you see populations responding to that by making the cones basically less appetizing with more woody tissue in them. So these kinds of, of microevolutionary patterns actually mirror the general macroevolutionary trends, which makes me think that there's some general uh, selective pressure going on over the course of the Mesozoic uh, that favors increased seed protection. So does this kind of Jurassic to Cretaceous shift in cone investment make any sense in terms of the animals that we know are around them? In the broadest sense, it does. But it's so broad as it may be almost meaningless. But in general sense, conifers going from their origins in the Carboniferous to now have to have experienced more predation pressure in the canopy because there was literally nothing eating them in the canopy besides insects in the Carboniferous. And now there's all sorts of other mammals and things that do it and birds. But in general, this kind of Jurassic time frame makes some sense. So as I said, by the late Triassic, you have the first really tall canopy browsers with prosauropods and sauropod dinosaurs. By the middle to late Jurassic, we have early mammals that have uh, morphological, sort of their limb features are suggesting that they are scansorial or in, at least in the canopy of the trees. And of course, we have early birds um, by, from the late Jurassic to the early uh, Cretaceous. And I have this listed here because we have some early Cretaceous birds that actually have gymnosperm seeds in their guts. At least one specimen has seeds of gymnosperm in its guts. Now, you don't really know from a fossil whether that was just the accidental thing that killed it, but we have at least some evidence that by the early Cretaceous, there were uh, at least, there were bird-line dinosaurs, maybe dinosaurs versus actual, actual birds, um, but there were small bird-like things that were eating uh, seeds that we know of. So this kind of general time frame does make sense with this kind of ratcheting pressure of having more and more actors in the canopy that could potentially be messing up conifer cones. And of course, there's a general background of increasing insect predation pressure. So you have the, from the late Triassic onwards, you have the appearance of beetles and weevils and things like that, which we know are major seed pests and cone pests of conifers today. So I think in general, it's inarguable that things have gotten worse for being a conifer, and from the seed cone perspective, from the Carboniferous to now. And the same types of patterns that we see in these cones, from these long, thin, flimsy things to these heavily armored, robust things, at least in many species, kind of mirror those general patterns. And I would say that these are not the kind of interactions that you can easily see in the fossil record. You can't normally tell what's going on in, a, in the canopy of the forest. And I think actually conifer cones, because they are robust and well-preserved, can give you some sense of the kinds of interactions that you normally wouldn't be able to see. So this kind of change in the Jurassic, I think, tells you something about the sort of strength and intensity of these interactions in the canopy over the Mesozoic that you otherwise wouldn't know about. So as I said, I think it's a sort of gradual ratcheting 
of predation pressure that leads to these robust cones on the one hand, but then seemingly paradoxically, these really non-armored, fleshy uh, cones on the other hand. So that's what I want to talk about um, in this last part of the talk. So in general, we have kind of three morphologies that we can think about. It's kind of analogous to some perhaps angiosperm reproductive structures. Things like a juniper here are this small, we call them berries. They're really a, a fused cone. There's a few scales that are fused together and become kind of leathery and fleshy. And they usually enclose a few seeds. This podocarpus that I showed you earlier, we can call a sort of an aerolate-like structure. It has one or two cone scales with one or two exposed seeds. A lot of other podocarps form kind of a droop-like structure. If you were to cut through this fleshy, sort of fruit-looking thing, you'd see there was a large enclosed seed within that. And we see these types of structures not only actually repeatedly evolved in conifers, but also in other gymnosperms. So this looks a lot like the general structure of an ephedra, and this looks a lot like the general structure of a needum. They're only analogous. They have, um, the, the, all these different plant groups have different specific tissues that they're doing to make these structures. But we see these same kind of forms evolve repeatedly in conifers and in gymnosperms in general. So you can kind of imagine that the fossil record is not a great source of information for these kind of fleshy structures. They're small, they smash easily, so they're not easily preserved. If you actually find them at all, you're not likely to be able to describe them. They would just be a little black smudge or brown smudge on a rock, and they wouldn't be of good use of your time. And so we basically have none of them, except for just a few in the Cretaceous, of the things that seem like they're fleshy reduced structures that look like this. But in general, the fossil record is not going to be such a great source of information like it was with the robust cones because of the nature of fossilization for these things. So what we can do instead is ask what the modern day phylogeny tells us, what the distribution of these traits amongst living species might tell us about when and how they evolved. So here, we have three lineages that are primarily sort of involved in this. Podocarbaceae, uh, have sort of all these different types. Um, they have little berry-like things, they have droops, and they have these aerolate-like things. The Taxaceae include these droops and aerolite, aerolate forms. And within the Cupressaceae, we have one lineage, the junipers, that have these fleshy, biotically dispersed structures. Now, many of these groups also include some types of woody or non-fleshy cones. We see them in the Podocarp basin in the Cupressaceae. And we know that this kind of morphology was ancestral, or at least we think it was ancestral, in, in conifers because these are the only types of morphologies we see back here. So we can use these relationships amongst all these different groups and within the, within the general, within these larger families to try and sort of disentangle what's happened, when and how these, uh, morph these morphological structures evolved. So what I want to do is show you sort of a model of character evolution. I don't want to go into it in too much detail, but what we can do is we can kind of break the conifer world up into whether the cone is, whether the entire reproductive structure is large or small, whether it has a lot of seeds or few seeds, and whether it's dry or fleshy. And so we can, we can arrange these combinations of states into eight particular trait combinations. And so, here, of course, we'd have a large cone with many seeds that's dry. It's your typical pine cone. On the other hand, we might have a small cone that has few seeds that's fleshy, your typical podocarbacy kind of thing. Now, large and small might seem like pretty arbitrary distinctions, but they're actually shockingly not arbitrary in conifers. We can actually draw a nice line between these sort of bimodal distributions between small cones and big cones. So we can score all these taxa for these sort of trait combinations, and we can put them into an evolutionary model that I'm not going to get into the details of, but we can ask, what's the order of these transitions? What was first, and how do you get to this state? Do you evolve through these intermediates that aren't observed, or do you follow a pathway that kind of goes down this way? Do you become small first, and then fleshy, and then you lose the number of seeds that you have, or is it a different pathway altogether? So when we do that, we can get a solution, sort of, we, get, we can ask a computer what is the favored path of evolution in these things. We get something that looks like this, 
the arrows here correspond to the transition rates between these things. I don't want you to focus on that. That just sort of got grandfathered in here. But basically, what this is saying is that you have transitions between large and small cones. Then you have transitions between, once you get small, you have transitions between fleshy and non-fleshy. And then you have fleshy structures here, and then you start losing seeds. And then you might actually gain size again. That's what this is suggesting. That the way these morphologies, these fleshy morphologies evolve, is that first you reduce the cone size, then you become fleshy, and then you reduce the number of seeds that you have. It suggests that's the order of things. Which sort of makes some sense um, in terms of the starting position of coming from this robust woody structure that was large and has a lot of seeds. We can actually see this happening a little bit in modern day conifers. So on the one hand, we have junipers here. You can actually see the little scale tips. You can see the tips of the scales here. In between them, there's kind of a suture zone that you can't really see, where these scales, these isolated scales become sort of fused together, and they become fleshy and pulpy. And they never open up. And so this cone then encloses the seeds that are inside it, and it's dispersed as a single unit that is apparently attractive to birds. I've never once seen a bird eat a juniper berry, um, but, but they do because you can find them um, and you can see that they actually eat them. And so they do that, but then on the other hand, we have some more transitional members here like Phytoclatus, the Oriental Arborvitae, where you have actually can still see the sutures between these little scales. If you see here, these scales are kind of turgid and a little bit fleshy when they're when they're young, when they're maturing, but as they dry and mature, they sort of they become these sort of woody, uh, dried down scales. So you actually can imagine how it might be pretty simple to transition from one to the other by simply never opening up. You don't dry out, you just remain turgid and fleshy. And it's these kinds of characteristics within the context of the entire sort of phylogeny of Cupressaceae, with these things are members, um, that actually leads to this particular pattern. So then after you become fleshy, this analysis says, then you reduce the number of seeds. And you can sort of cycle back and forth between large and, and small structures um, that are dispersed by animals here. So I would say that these are kind of hyper-specialized for dispersal by animals. Just a single seed and a single package of enticing sort of fleshy sweet tissue. So but why would you have these different morphologies? Uh, is there any kind of functional significance or structural significance to going back and forth from these different uh, biotically dispersed morphologies. So I think what's actually going on is it has to do with the size of the seeds. So if we look at these structures between the berries, the aerolates, and the droops, we actually see that the length of the seed that's in them or on them, uh, has, so there's slight differences amongst these things. So the aerolate ones tend to be bigger than the berries, and the droops are definitely larger uh, than any other thing. So we have larger individual investment and offspring in these aerolate and droop taxa. So, and at the same time, the total length of the reproductive structure, though, isn't changing all that much. So as we change size, seed sizes in these taxa, they have these sort of fleshy morphologies associated with those seeds as sort of minimizing the total length of the reproductive structure, if that makes sense. So you can imagine that this structure here, because it has a seed on the outside, and this fleshy part below has a certain total length. But as the seed gets larger, it would become larger and larger and more and more difficult for an animal to swallow that thing. So what it essentially does is tuck the seed inside this fleshy package around it. So I think what's happening in the evolution of these different morphologies is that as you have various selective pressures for different the evolution of different seed sizes, and that's an entire sort of separate question, separate field of botany, you have a concomitant shift in morphologies in order to minimize the total length of that reproductive structure. So even as your seeds get really big in these droops, your overall reproductive structure length is pretty small. And the reason for doing that is so you can always fit in a bird's mouth. Uh, because <laughs> in bird dispersed plants, Seed and fruit size is really limited by their gait width. Okay, so they just won't eat anything um, if it won't fit in their mouth. Of course, I know this is a seagull that doesn't eat these things. But anyway, um, 
In conifers and in other gymnosperms that share these morphologies, animal dispersed morphologies are kind of minimizing this total cone length, regardless of your seed size. And so it maximizes the potential number of small birds or mammals that are capable of dispersing these things. So there's sort of a general split between protective morphologies like robust pine cones and dispersal morphologies. And within the dispersal specialist morphologies, we get kind of these three flavors that seem to correspond roughly to differences in seed size. So to kind of summarize everything, you can imagine that you start in the late Triassic, early Jurassic with this kind of ancestral conifer cone morphology. It's thin, it's flimsy, the seeds are right at the surface. Now as these various selective pressures are ratcheting up in terms of vertebrates, insects, and uh, vertebrate dispersal, you kind of have sort of two suites of solutions. You have this kind of protection solution, if you want to think about it that way, where you wall the cone off and it becomes a very robust and woody. Or you forget about all that and you decide you're just going to let animals take the seeds away and you're going to hope that some fraction of them end up being dispersed. And that's what these do uh, by evolving these particular sort of suite, what we're going to call dispersal solutions, to this general problem of what do you do in a world in which these pressures are ratcheting up uh, gradually over the course of millions of years. So I think the diversity of conifer cones is the transition from these thin structures that are, that are essentially just uh, a scaffold to hold these things on to a whole range of solutions to this problem of how best do you trade off good dispersal versus good protection in a world in which you have different groups of animals and insects coming in and out of existence. Uh, pr predation pressures are changing in different parts of the world at different times. And so you have just a whole bunch of different potential solutions to these functional problems, which can take the form of everything from a fur cone to everything uh, like this Micrococcus or raspberry pine, uh, they call it, even though it's a podocarp basis, where you have all these little fleshy scales. So what I hope you've seen is that you can generate morphological diversity in a lot of different ways. You can have something as simple as basically neutral shifts in development that can lead to very different morphologies. Well, very different from my perspective. They do all look kind of the same in an objective sense. Very different morphologies, very different structures at pollination. And then going forward, there's all these sort of there's all these potential solutions to how do you protect the seed versus how you disperse the seed. And in some cases, those are as simple as walling the cone off and then opening it up. In some cases, those are more focused, at least, on dispersal. And it's really these changes in seed protection and dispersal over the Mesozoic that generate the range of cone morphologies that we see today. So most of these cones, so their functionality, their morphology, the way they look and what they do is kind of a post-Jurassic uh, world of mammals and, and small birds, and ones that have been really successful in this particular environment. So the last thing that I want to talk about then is sort of a, a direction that work in the lab is going, which is trying to understand what the spatial distribution of these things is, and whether that can shape the morphology that we see. And this is really work in progress, and I'll have any particular answer. But I just wanted you to show, I just want you to see what kind of work is going on. So this is another postdoc in the lab, Makula. And she is working on integrating all this data that we have for conifer ranges. So we have high quality geographic data for every single conifer species, because people have made a lot of herbarium collections over the years. Um, we have all this nice phylogenetic data. We have a, a phylogeny that has basically every known conifer species in it. And we have all this interesting trait data about comorphology and seed size and things like that. And so what we want to understand is that we know that conifer species richness, the, the actual sort of biogeography of these major families and clades uh, aren't evenly distributed, and neither are the cone types. So species certainly aren't distributed evenly around the world. And even within this, you have ma mostly podocarps in the tropics, and mostly pines and cupressaceae in the northern hemisphere, how does all this affect the kinds of morphologies that we see? And the answer, of course, is that it's extremely complicated. But here's a map showing just the number of biotically dispersed species, so maybe these species that have these kind of fleshy cone morphologies. And you can see that they are concentrated in certain regions, so sort of northern Mexico, southwestern US, the Mediterranean, spent all across China. And then into the tropics here, we have lots of biotically dispersed species. In Southeast Asia, these are primarily podocarps, but in China, there's a mixture of all sorts of different things, which is general of the sort of conifer communities there. 
But not all these are the fleshy morphologies that I showed you about. As you may know, some pine species have these robust cones, but they're actually uh, dispersed by animals that pluck the seeds out. Now, those cones are slightly less robust uh, than other members of the Pinaceae. But we can look at this in more detail by looking at just the sort of proportion of fleshy cone species. You can see basically there's a high proportion of these fleshy species in the tropics and then in a couple of areas that are basically depauperate with conifers. The reason there's a high proportion of fleshy species here is that there is one juniper species and one juniper species. So that just happens to be, because of the physiology of juniperus, it does well in these areas. But if you look at the more species rich areas, it's the tropics that really dominate this proportion of fleshy cone species. Because we have a lot of protocarps there. And so what happens is that phylogeny environment and cone morphology are all correlated with each other and they're difficult to tease apart. And so that's why you need someone who really knows how to do through biostats to try and determine what the history of these things is and how these fleshy cone morphologies might relate um, to the sort of tropical environment that they're in. So I don't have an answer, but what we want to do is kind of combine this type of morphological kind of functional information with the spatial distribution of these traits to understand how these morphologies might influence where they are in the world and how in turn where they are in the world might influence the selective pressures that sort of feed in to these kind of morphologies. So that's, that's it. Um, I have some cones up there on the table if you'd like to take a look at them or you want me to sort of talk about them, I'd be happy to. Um, that show I, I tried to find some of the range of morphologies that we see amongst conifer cones. But I hope that you, if nothing else, think about conifer cones as kind of this recording of all sorts of different selective pressures. So there's all these sort of, there's this functionality that's built into these cones. They have all these different functions that have to greatly change over the course of their development. And there's all these morphological aspects of them that probably reflect some major changes in the way terrestrial ecosystems were structured uh, over the course of the Jurassic and Cretaceous and on to the modern world. So when you see a spiny pine cone like this Pinus pungens, you're seeing this sort of history of rodent interactions um, generating these kind of morphologies that we see. So I think that's where I'll leave it. couple of things. One is, I guess one of the things I would keep in mind would be the earlier pressures uh, of this development may have, maybe because that the, the fruits themselves were not the target. I wonder, you got these large herbivores, mm -hmm. you know, earlier on. And maybe it wasn't the target, but by beefing up the fruit, it was a way of that fruit surviving. Yeah, there's a, there's a idea that smaller animals like squirrels and birds would exert a much more directed selective pressure on these things and that perhaps a lot of what we're seeing is basically the pressures of the kind of later Cretaceous and Cenozoic and that before that sauropods shouldn't be really selective about what they eat they should just be scraping everything off the branches that may work for some of the earlier things that we see these ericarias here which would have been herbivorized by sauropods, um, some of them are quite large. They're kind of volleyball-sized cones. Perhaps that was some kind of deterrent to, um, to a sauropod. But basically, the thought is that there's not much they could have done. And so they're not going to show much morphology. There's not sort of uh, avenues of morphological evolution available in that kind of whole plant uh, sort of uh, predation context. Mm -hmm. It's really when you get these small actors, these sort of smaller birds and mammals, where you get things that are sort of laser focused on particular aspects, particular organ level aspects of the of the morphology. Yeah. Well, the, one other quick little comment would be the real ones. Maybe the fleshy part down below is the target, and the other just flicks off. So they're yeah. kind of stuck together. Um, yeah. There's not as much literature about exactly how things eat the protocars because it's sort of tropical stuff, um, and we know a lot more about how things work in Western North America. My sense is that they, if they're flicking the seeds off right away, they're not doing their job really. They need to be, they need to be sort of internally eaten or at least carried for some distance away from the tree. I've never watched a bird eat protocarp seed. I suspect that some fraction of the seeds just falls off right there and some fraction is actually sort of eaten. 
I think what they tend to do, from what I've read, is they tend to ingest large amounts of the seed, process it quickly in their stomach, and then regurgitate it pretty quickly. So most of the seeds do end up right around the tree, but occasionally they fly a little further away. Yeah. The, last, the last question is, I know the Araucaria from uh, South America, uh, it's a pretty strange cone structure, and it's not really conical in a, in a large sense, and almost a nut kind of thing. And uh, I don't know how that development fits in with all of this. So the, the air It's a pretty open structure, you know, and uh, the air carrier, carbon. The, uh, the air carrier cones, when they're developing, are these kind of closed green things, and then they fall apart, actually, at maturity to make the kind of the nutlets that people, that people eat. So, in general, the, um, they have a, a morphological trajectory that kind of mirrors this, where early in their development, they're kind of these compact structures. Um, and then they get spines and things on them. But basically, it sort of works within this whole kind of context. Um, now, the agathis looks more like this, this thing here. Um, but uh, the, the, the species of Araucaria that you might be thinking of, the monkey paws and things, they have these really big, chunky cones. But they tend to fall apart at maturity. Yeah. Yeah. What about amber? Have uh, seeds been preserved that way that would keep those? Uh, so that's there's conifer remains in amber, particularly leaves and things like that. I don't know of any uh, fleshy conifer cone preserved in the amber. There's a few that are preserved as permineralizations, but that is a good idea. Um, but uh, I don't. I'm not aware of any. No. So there's a key pattern which I'm not sure if you know about it, but that supposedly, well, with, with a lot of these gymnosperms, that the ones with fleshy fruits, fruits are often dioecious, yeah. they have separate male and female plants, but you know, can you I, connect that into your We, we actually wrote a whole paper about that, um, and uh, I can, I'd be more than happy to, to send it to you if you'd like. Uh, so basically, yes, they, there was this sort of famous argument about dioecy and, and <coughs> gymnosperms. So there was an original paper in the 80s that sh showed that in general, like Gibnish? Gibnish paper, yeah. showed that gymnosperms usually have fleshy fruits if they're fruits, if they're dioecious. And then Michael Donahue wrote a paper that said you can't say that because you didn't correct for phylogeny. And it could be that they just have a single origin of both traits and they've all inherited that. So we went back and looked at this with a conifer tree and the answer is not particularly clear. So what seems to be the case is that the number of origins of all these trait combinations is roughly equal. But fleshiness and dioecy and dry and monoecy are successful ones and they have a lot of species in them. So they're correlated in that sense. But if you just look at the sheer number of origins, almost all the different trait combinations occur with roughly equal frequency. So dry and dioecy does occur several times too. It's in the southern hemisphere and podocarps are dry and dioecious. If you actually look at the number of origins of all these trait combinations, it's pretty similar. So we suggested that you can be dioecious or monoecious for a whole bunch of different reasons, of which we don't really know the answer to. But it seems like dioecy with fleshy cones is a workable s solution to sort of, you have enforced outcrossing and you have good dispersal. And that monoecy with dry sort of wind dispersed seeds is sort of like this bed hedging against against that, but um, it's basically complicated, um, and there doesn't seem to be any great correlation between them. There's a correlation at the species level, but not at the sort of at the phylogenetic level. Yeah. So, so this paper thirty years ago was. It was good for the time, but maybe. Well, see, if you go back and read Gibnish's paper, his point wasn't really about how many times it evolved. So I would say that his basic premise isn't necessarily wrong. Um, but it's more that the it's totally it's totally consistent with Gibbonish paper. The the idea that you're fleshy and dioecious is a sort of good general strategy. Um, yeah, that's that's what I was saying. Yeah. Some broadleaf plants have cone-like structures. Are they considered conifers? Uh, well, they're only conifers if they're within this sort of evolutionary lineage. So they're kind of conifer mimics. So things like. Um, Cassiorhinus is kind of an amazing conifer mimic. It, it looks like a pine tree. It even has these kind of woody infructescences. Um, but uh, no, they would only be considered conifers if they're in this in this phylogenetic lineage. Uh, so it's more it's more based on 
whom they're related to, not just the sort of general characteristics of reproductive structure. So none of them do have broad leaves? Some podocarps do, um, and some areas do. So some of the tropical ones have broader leaves that are multi-veined, and they can almost, they don't quite look like ginkgo leaves. They look kind of like cycad leaves sometimes. Yeah, so there are a few, if you want to call them broader leaf. They don't have the venation density or complexity of flowering plants, but they do have broader kind of ginkgo-like leaves. Are any of the fleshy fruited species very strongly protected by plant secondary compounds? They, they must be, right? Like they, there must be something going on. All I can tell you is that, uh, of course, Taxus is famous for being poisonous. The arrow isn't, at least when it's mature. But I don't know of anyone who's tried to eat it when it's immature. But um, they must be, they must have some sort of, either they're not very enticing to animals because there's only a single seed there or as it's maturing, there's not a lot of nutrients put in it yet, or it is chemically protected, and I assume that it's chemically protected. Um, and that's the kind of thing we really couldn't ever get from the fossil record. But yeah, there's this problem with all this stuff that I'm talking about, which is that it's either protection or dispersal, but how do you protect the dispersal morphologies throughout their development? And why can't you do that chemically with these um, big, robust cones? So another thing that people suggested is that these things are about fire, um, and to me, I just don't see it because there was a lot of fire in the Carboniferous, there was a lot of fire in the Permian, and the cones just don't look well protected. And when you look at the distribution of cones today, while pines have a lot of fire adapted species and some heavy cones, there's a lot of non fire adapted pines, and there's a lot of non fire adapted other pinaceae that also have robust cones. So either they inherited that with fire and then lost it, or it's this sort of specialized thing that's happened amongst things that already had cones. But I'm open to the possibility that, that fire played some kind of role in, in sort of taking species down this particular pathway. What I actually think happened, don't really, have, didn't think I had time to get into this, is that why do you have small cones in the first place? There's a lot of things that have woody, small, but robust cones. You can think of like Chemiciparus or Cupressus. They have small cones because they literally can't have big cones because they have tiny little branches. And the way conifers work, pollination always occurs at the tip of the branch. And so their branches are simply too small to have large cones on them. They can't have big cones that are born and sort of deep in the tree in, in a trunk. And so what happens is that you get some species of conifers that are basically stuck having little cones, like junipers <coughs> versus the pinaceae. So these things all have little cones. And I think what happens is, when you have these little cones, it's easier to transition to these fleshy morphologies. Um, just developmentally, it's easier to imagine making that shift. And the animal dispersed pines, which are kind of architecturally stuck having these big, robust cones, what they do is basically just allow animals to go into the scales. They make the scales slightly flabbier. They don't actually develop these sort of fleshy, berry-like morphologies. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do get more into the space where, where these things are occurring, the distribution? Do you, do you see yourself getting sucked into climate change or anything like that, how, how these systems are? I mean, I'm really not trained in that kind of yeah. stuff, but uh, uh, yes, they should, many of these things, the conifers are you know, often very sensitive to changes in climate. Um, some of them are pretty hardy plants, but a lot of conifers are really not very hardy. Um, and so there are some pine species and junipers that are well adapted to arid and dry climates, but a lot of conifers are kind of mesic forest species. And so, uh, yes, because it influences their distributions. And when we think about where they are now and where they might have been in the past, it's natural to think about how affected they may be by these kind of things. But I would say it's definitely well outside of my uh, expertise. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how is seed size in the cones linked to whether they have wings or not? So the, uh, generally in pines, it's linked uh, with with size, so in, in the Pinaceae, the larger seeds tend to, to not have wings. And the thought is that the wings have just been lost as they are not necessary for animal dispersal. There are a few relatively large seeded wing things, like aves and things like that. Um, and that's an interesting story in its own right, but time to go into that. But in general, um, once you get down to this really tiny seeds, seed range, they have rudimentary wings, but they don't seem to need really large ones given their mass. and so they. They kind of have these little tiny wings. 
But the general thought is that you get really big seeds and you can't scale the wing up enough to make the, um, to make the wing loading enough so that they can rotate. Yeah. So there, there are no dipterocarps in, in conifers, things with really big seeds that have really big wings. And the theory about that is that they're enclosed within a cone. They, they can't make a big enough cone to make a big enough wing to actually effectively have um, good dispersal of really large seeds. So, yeah. But you see that transition a lot in pinus, where they get larger seeds without wings. Yeah. If there's any more questions, you can take them next door. We'll have some refreshments over there. Um, thank you. Thanks.